Are we ready? Y'all ready for the word? I'm in part two of a four-part series called God's Family. And without further ado, we assign music. Let's go back to 1979, huh? At the Capitol Center. The Sister Sledge. Hit them with it. I love it. I love it. Yes, we are family. And today I want you to join me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you have access to a Bible and you can get, you want to follow along in it, I'm in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And it is a new custom for us, but it is a legitimate custom for us that when you're physically able to stand without harm to yourself, that you would stand all across our campuses for the reading of the word during this time. And if you have a seat on your row near you, if you would just put your hand up. I should have waited. Just shouldn't have had you stand up first, but too late. But yeah, we got you. Amen. Give it up for the late people. No, I'm just joking. I'm not even, I'm not, I didn't mean that. That was the devil. Sometimes the devil will get in there. I don't want that smoke. I mean, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 12, verse 13, and verse 25, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. And here's what it says. It says in verse 12, dear brothers, let me read from them. Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders. Everybody say leaders. leaders. In the Lord's work. Mm -hmm. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Verse 13, show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work. We talked last week about the end of that verse and live peacefully, peacefully with each other. Go down to verse 25, and that'll be what we focus on. Dear brothers and sisters, pray for us. You may be seated. I want to talk to you today from the topic, the family leaders. In God's family, he has created a structure in an organization, and in that structure is leadership. And I want to talk to you today about how to honor leaders, how to, what the Bible teaches us about how to treat leaders and respond to them. Uh, and so we're going to talk about the family leaders. Now, last week in part one of this series, we talked about our responsibility for interpersonal relationships, that the, the importance of loving each other and, and, and living peacefully with each other and, and, and building each other up, which is challenging and encouraging one another. We talked about the challenges of interpersonal relationships and doing the hard work to maintain the bond of peace in the spirit of love. Like that, that is work. It is work to get along with other people. We talked about having challenging and difficult conversations that can be redemptive and restorative if we do them right. Uh, and we talked about how it is, it is actually fruitless to talk about somebody that you need to talk to. If somebody offends you and you don't talk to them, but you talk to other people, you're just spreading cancer and poison into other relationships. And I gave you a strategy and a system of how to approach somebody who's offended you and how to respond to somebody you've offended. And if you haven't seen part one, that might be very important to go back and watch and listen to because we talked about that. And it's something that we need to practice in our relationships. Now today I'm going to talk about church leadership. It is a little weird for me. These are kind of passages that I skip over over and avoid because I don't want to seem like it's being done for my own selfish aggrandizement. But I really believe God wants us to understand how this thing works in his family. And you can't talk about God's family without talking about the leadership in his family. So in verse 12, he starts off by saying three things. He says, first of all, brothers and sisters, I want you to honor leaders. Everybody say honor them. And he says, I want you to honor them for two reasons. If we honor them, those in the Lord's work, thank you so much. 
God is speaking to you in the back. And he said, bring the chair. Um, <laughs> he said, we honor for two reasons. The second half of the verse says, because they work hard among you and because they give you spiritual guidance. Do y'all see that? They're doing two things. You honor them because they work hard among you and they give you spiritual guidance. Now, the word honor means to hold in high regard, to hold in high esteem. And the Apostle Paul, who's writing this to the church of Thessalonica, says you do it for two reasons. First of all, because people in ministry leadership work hard. Yeah. Ministry is hard work. Yeah. Yeah. This is not easy. Because not only does it require competence and professionalism, but it also requires a high level of character. Because the people you lead in the church expect you to have a level of holiness and righteousness and integrity that they don't have. I'm going to say that again. And they will leave you if you don't live up to their expectations, even though they don't. But you have to do it in the same kind of body that they do it in. Like, I don't get a, I, don't, I didn't, when I answered the call to be in ministry leadership, I didn't get a special, like, clergy body. Like, I get tempted like you do. I get tired like you do. I get angry like you do. And so we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us, but it's hard work. It is hard work. It requires sacrifice. While some of y'all are going out today after church and go have mimosas and you're going to brunch, guess where I'll still be? Like, this is the assignment. Some of you, your Saturdays are for washing cars and relaxing and watching cartoons and cleaning the house. My Saturdays are being spent praying and pouring over passages and studying from Friday. When you hit, when you hit five o'clock on Friday and you're like, here's the weekend, it's happy hour time, that's when it's ramping up for me. More anxiety, more tension. I got to do this again in spite of what I may be dealing with in my own life, in my own health, in my own situation. I still got to come prepared to do this on Sunday. That is a sacrifice that you have to make when you're in leadership. And many people who serve in ministry in our church have left lucrative jobs to give their life to Christian service. We got almost 200 employees in our church, and many of them were doing much better financially where they were before they came here. This ain't, this ain't no gig. This ain't just a nine to five. This is a calling over our life. We've left our dreams in some situations. We've left our aspirations. I wanted to tell jokes for a living. Even when God told me I was going to have to preach, I just said, well, I'll tell clean jokes, anything. I'd rather do anything to be up here preaching. This is not what I chose in life. I was chosen to do this. I had to surrender to this. I had to yield to this. I had to give up my aspirations and dreams. And sometimes when you tell your family what you feel called to do, it doesn't make sense to them logically, and it sure don't make sense to them financially. Well, how are we going to make it doing this? He always... All I have needed, his hand has provided. See, sometimes when you make a lot of money, you think it's you. But when you don't have enough and he still makes a way, you have to say, all I have needed, your hand, oh God, your hand. It's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. And it is hard work that we have to do to be involved in this work. And he says, not just, not just, not just the fact that they work hard, but look at the verse. It says, we, they work hard among you in verse 12. Among you. He, 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 leadership in the church is not for people to just be over you. It is service among you. It is holding your hand and walking you through difficulty. It is serving your children and praying for you and giving you guidance. They serve among you, and that is challenging and difficult work to do. But it's also the fact that the work is hard also because it's to give people in leadership, give spiritual guidance. That spiritual guidance to give people is hard because trying to get a person to think spiritually and not secularly is hard. Giving a person spiritual counsel and advice that comes from a whole different form of reference and thinking, their whole worldview is different than what God tells us to do. And when you start counseling somebody, it's hard work, partly because after you spend an hour counseling and advising them, they go back into their context and behave exactly like they were behaving that got you in their office. And then when they don't do what you say, then they later on say, yeah, I tried counseling. I went over to the church to do counseling. You try, you ain't tried counseling, you went to counseling, then you left counseling and did what you do. That's hard. 
When you know people ain't, oh, you done upgraded. When you know, <laughs> if you're listening on the radio, somebody just bought me a better chair, amen. <laughs> Hey, so, 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 so you, spiritual guidance comes through counseling. It comes through advice. It comes through mentoring and discipleship. Mentoring somebody, discipling somebody means you got to give them your number. You got to give them time. You got to give access to them to reach out to you at strange hours because they might be ready to do something crazy for accountability's sake. You got to check up on them and hold. That's work, y'all. This is hard work. And then the work of preaching and teaching, spiritual guidance through that. That might, I can't even, I can't, I would need all day to tell you how much work goes into preaching and teaching. Yeah. This is not something I'm making up as I'm standing up here. How many of you ever read the Bible and parts of the Bible, you read the Bible and say, yeah, I don't understand that. That's a little confusing. Thou, thither, whither, so ever, thou goest. Well, guess what? This is the book I have to teach y'all. It's hard to understand this book. I don't have a special ear and understanding this book. I got to go in and research it. I got to get a thesaurus and, and a concordance. I can't even say the word. And research materials. I got to paste the floor and say, God, I don't understand what that means. What are you trying to say to us? I got to seek him and do research and understanding because I'm speaking to a wide variety of people. In one service, you can have one person in the service that knows very little about the Bible. And then in this church, you can have some who actually teaches the Bible at a university or seminary in the same service. You got people been walking with the Lord for 30 years. They know the book. You got other people that don't even know where the book of Genesis is in the Bible. That's the audience that I'm talking to. So you got one group of people. All they want is application. You got another group of people. They just need explanation. Then you got another group of people who's judging my interpretation. I got to deal with that every Sunday. Somebody, that just because I didn't say the Greek word or the Hebrew word, they're measuring my hermeneutic against their research. When I'm doing homiletic, they y'all don't even understand what I'm saying right here. See, I preach the Bible in a way that once I interpret it and understand it, I put Afro sheen on it and then bring it into my culture and talk the language of my people. It ain't that I don't know what it said back here. Just, it don't mean I don't know Greek and Hebrew. I know the Greek and Hebrew, but I also got on draws. But you ain't got to see them. Just because just, just I know it don't mean I got to show it. I'm trying to make it make sense for you. That's hard work. Taking a spiritual document and making it make sense for your job, for your family, for your life. That's hard work. Do you understand what I'm saying? And to do that week in and week out to an audience, so not only must you have academic accuracy, but you also got to have spiritual integrity. You got to walk with God close enough so that he can tell you what to preach. I don't just come up here and preach what I want to preach. I pray and I seek God. That's why sometimes when I'm preaching, you'll be like, that's just what I needed to hear. You don't even know I was just reading that. I was just talking about something. How many people know I was just talking about that last night? That is confirmation. You know how that happened? Not because I know, because I talked to the one who knows, and he told me what to say, and you say, that man talking to me. I ain't talking to you. God talking to you through me. So you got to have spiritual devotion. You got to have academic commitment. Then you got to have homiletical presentation. You got to come up here on stage and preach it in front of people who have low, low attention spans. <laughs> who are easily bored, who are checking their phones, people got attitudes because their girlfriend told them to come hear you, and they already jealous because they think, you, you don't talk about me like that. Why are you always talking about him? I got to overcome all that. Then we got crazy people who think they're supposed to have personal meetings with me and give me words from God all the time. There's always threats. There's always somebody around here that got another agenda. I got to deal with all that. Got people not getting along, stuff going on in my own life. I got to deal with all that and stand up here and then be interesting and engaging because if you're bored for one second, you're going to miss the whole message. And how much more? And then some people, it's even harder on my pastors because when they come up here, you got an attitude because it ain't me. And now you want to leave where Pastor Battle at? How come he ain't preaching to us? As if I'm the only one that can say something to you. The devil is a liar. God's word can be presented through anybody. Oh, y'all going to tell the truth now. You're calling the church. Is Pastor Battle there? Is he preaching? That's pressure on me. I can't even get my knee right because I'm trying to keep y'all satisfied. <laughs> so, 
Somebody say it's hard work. It's hard work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me Hebrews, Hebrews 13, 7. Hebrews 13, 7. Am I boring, y'all? No. I don't care. Verse 13, 7. Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Remember them. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. When you have a man or a woman of God to teach you the word of God, remember them. Honor them. Honor them. It's a privilege. There's no other place you can get God's word than from your messenger. Listen to this. In verse, in verse 17 of Hebrews 13, it says, obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. We only like that part. Ain't, no, ain't nobody standing up on that. <laughs> Talk to me, Landover. Their work is to watch over your souls. And they're accountable to God, Pastor Sean and Fort Washington. They, listen, to, this is our job. Listen, not only, listen to what we do. We are accountable to God. Yeah, we stole Leah today. Yeah, we are accountable to God. Y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. We, <laughs> we are accountable to God and we watch over your souls. That's the internal, eternal part of you. There are medical doctors in here who watch over your brain or your, your neurology or your, your blood. I have a hematologist. They have people who watch over different parts of you, but nobody's watching over your soul. I got a doctor that's going to do surgery on my knee coming up soon. He's an he's a orthopedic doctor. He's going to watch over my knee, but not my soul. Who else has a responsibility to watch, professionally watch over somebody's soul and accountable to God? This is serious. This is hard work. And so it should be, they should, people who do it should be honored. Everybody say honor. Let me go to verse 13. The next thing it says is it says, treat them with great respect and wholehearted love. Let's talk about that. Paul says, you're talking about spiritual leaders, you're talking about leaders in God's family, treat them with great respect. I think Paul put that adjective great in there. He said, maybe if I put great in there, it'll keep you further away from disrespect. Don't disrespect your leaders, treat them with great respect. You know why you treat them with great respect? Because, because even though we're human, we are not common. I'm gonna say that again. We may be human, but we are not common. This is an uncommon work. This is uncommon work. This is work from the womb to the tomb. We pray over babies. Somebody's in this service right now and want me to bless their babies. We prayed over people while babies were in the womb. We prayed for people to have successful pregnancy. Then we pray for, we minister to the children when they come out the room. And then they go to SK and stream and tear the church up. You know your little bad kid number be coming up on the screen, but we still praying for little Roscoe too. And then when they're in the teenage place, they're going to, they're going to off script. They're on the retreat now. Probably the police looking for them, but we got them. We love them. They get young adults. We marry them. We counsel them. And then when they die, we eulogize them and bury them. Who else works with people from the womb to the tomb and everywhere in between? And then if you show up at the tomb, you got to be sad with the family, even though you just left a wedding and you had to be happy. It's schizophrenic, I'm telling you. You can't show up to wedding, you forget where you are. Oh, you say, dearly beloved, you don't know if you had a funeral or a wedding right now. Then somebody wants you to go bless the house. Come on over, bless my house. What are we going to bless the wood and the, the chairs? and the, the house ain't blessed if you ain't blessed. But if you say no to them because you got to, oh, y'all ain't ready for me today. I got to, let me leave all that alone. This is not easy work. It says, show them great respect. Not only showing show great respect, but also says in verse 13, let me get to this. He says, he says also, and show them wholehearted love. In fact, let me tell you how powerful this assignment is. The powerful assignment is there was a time before this world got kind of crazy that only two people could pronounce you man and wife, a judge at the courthouse or an ordained minister. Only two people could say that. Now, let me tell you the power of this. An ordained minister with, this, with one stroke of the pen signing a marriage license and one word out of their mouth, I now by the power invested in me pronounce you man and wife. You could have had sex with each other before that statement and it would have been called fornication. After that statement, it's all good. That's some power right there. This, we ain't common. You may not like us, but we are not common. And he says, show them kind of people wholehearted love. You know what that means? Don't take us for granted. 
Don't take us for granted. Some of you have waited all your life to find a pastor that made sense to you. You waited for years to get to a church that would teach you the word of God and make you grow and be your best. Don't take that for granted. Don't take that for granted. Because you know what? You don't appreciate what you have till you miss what you had. He says this is, it'll be honored, it'll be respected with wholehearted love. And why? In the verse 13, why? Middle verse 13, because of their what? Watch this. When you go honor them, respect them, love them, the, bur- the passage never says do that to a spiritual leader because of their title. The Bible says honor your father and mother just because of their title. They don't have to do nothing. Biological parents, give them the honor. When it comes to spiritual leadership, he does not say honor them because they're a bishop or a pope or a rabbi or a prophetess or a prophet or an evangelist or apostle or any of those things. He says honor them because of their work. Go back to verse 12. I'll prove it to you. He says honor those who are, who are leaders in the Lord's what? They work. They work hard. Verse 13, show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their what? It's the work. Somebody say it's the work. Pay attention to the work because there are a lot of jokers who have ascended up in the ministry leadership who didn't put the work in. They like the title, but they don't want the task. They like the label, but they don't like the labor. Bars! You know I'm cooking now. They, they, they like to be called something, but they don't, like the, they don't like the responsibilities of the call. And they manipulate it and finagle their way up in the leadership. But what God says is watch the work. Watch the work. Honor them because of their work. And some of the work that they do, that's, it's the late nights. It's the early mornings. It's the long conversations trying to get somebody to see things through God's perspective. It's the people to say, you got a minute, and four hours later, we're still working through it. Yeah. And part of that work, too, is in God's family is fundraising. I got to teach you this because you don't, you, you, you think, you think, man, you think this is, this is, uh, I got to, let me tell y'all real quick what's wrong with me. I got to get this knee replaced. So that's something I haven't told y'all that yet. This knee needs to be replaced, but this hip has been compensating for it. And these suckers going like this on me, like I'm, like I got like the cabbage patch on me. So the sucker just like, act like I want to just do the wrong thing. All right, now you know. So hopefully, hopefully I won't do nothing to come loose. All right, so, 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 so we talk about fundraising in the church. Some people think all oh, church is like corrupt and all that. Understand this. A part of God's family, God's family is funded by generosity donations. It's called tithes and offerings. So watch this, y'all. We have to beg y'all to do what God told y'all to do. Ooh, y'all don't like that right there. Let me say it to somebody online right there. We have to beg y'all to do what God told you to do. He said bring your tithes and offers. You know why? Because that's how the work gets funded. When I worked at Giant Food, we, I used to work there too. The way we funded that, the way that organization is funded is through selling groceries. They sell stuff. They don't raise money. They sell stuff. When I worked here in this building, there was a Kmart. We sold jewelry and and clothes and appliances and electronics. That's how the organization was funded. We don't really sell stuff here. Even if you go buy, if you go over there and buy a hoodie in the bookstore, or you buy a book from our bookstore over the years, I can sw- I can assure you, we appreciate you buying it. It did not fund this work. Your hoodie did not pay the bill. I can assure you that. We have to raise funds. And a lot of leaders don't succeed in this kind of work because they don't fundraise. Now, here's the, here's the dichotomy. If it, seems, if it seems like to you I ask for money too much, you'll call me avaricious and suspicious. But if I don't ask for it at all, we got 200 employees we can't pay. We got buildings and electricity and all this stuff we can't provide. Right? So, 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 so here's, some, here's, the, here's the deal. There are some people who won't give unless you ask. There are some people that won't give because you asked. You missed that. You're going to get that going home. Some people, unless you ask, they won't give. Some people, because you asked. Yeah, I see what he's trying to do. (laughs) That's the world we live in. Then there are hundreds of people who are looking at me right now, if not thousands of people, who mooch off of this church and never put anything back into it. Even people who get paid. (laughs) Yeah. I'm not even trying to let y'all feel sorry for me. I'm just giving you the real. 
This is the work. This is the work. That's how this goes. Let me close. I'm going to look at verse 25 because something very interesting happens in verse 25 because the apostle Paul says this tenderly. He says, brothers and sisters, pray for us. Pray for us. And that is very interesting because Paul is a leader of this church at Thessalonica and he's asking the people he leads to pray for him. Now, if you go back to chapter one in verses one and two, in verse one, he tells who all the leaders are. He says, really, it's three leaders, three main leaders of this church, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And he says in verse two, what they have been doing for the church. Verse two, he says, we always thank God for all of you and we pray for you constantly. We pray for y'all all the time. In fact, verses 23, when you go back to chapter 5, verse 23 and 24, which come right before verse 25, is a prayer for them. He's only saying, now he's saying pray for us. He says, please return the favor. Pray for us. We need it too. We, we, we need you to pray for us because, see, when, you, when you're a part of the church and you're part of the congregation, if you're in a small group, and if you're not in a small group, I'd encourage you to get in one. But if you're in a good small group, if you have a struggle or a sin or an addiction or something you're dealing with, you can share with your small group and get... And here's what, here's what James 5 says, Brother Blossom. It says, if you confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, you can be healed. See, if you, confess your, if you confess your sins to God, he'll forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But it's, if you says, what's in James 5, 16, if you confess your sins to one another, you get healed. Yeah. So you can actually get healing from a small group community by confessing your sin. Wow. You can do that. Where do we go? Yeah. Yeah. The minute I tell y'all what I struggle with, it's going everywhere but to yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Child, between me and you, Pray for us. Pray for us. Anybody that's got wayward children, ever had a wayward child in their life, you usually get empathy from other parents who've got grown children and know how hard it is to keep your child on the right path in the world in which we live. You get empathy when you have a wayward child, but what about when you're a pastor and your child is wayward? Pray for us. Pray for us because sometimes our assignment calls us to help people in situations we have no frame of reference for. I don't know what it's like to be in your situation. And they're asking us questions that we don't have answers for. Pray for us. Pray for us because we didn't know when we signed up for this, the level of spiritual warfare that we would experience. That as shepherds, just like David, when he was rescuing, when he was a shepherd and he had sheep that were being attacked by a bear one time and being attacked by a lion one time. And in both instances, he protected the sheep from the bear and the lion. And both times the bear, both times the bear and the lion turned on him. And what I'm saying is sometimes you can deliver sheep from something that'll turn on you. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> sometimes when you save another family, your family has a bullseye on it. <laughs> I'm saying pray for us. Pray for us because sometimes we come into this work kicking and fussing and there's pressure on us. And then while you're praying for us, pray for our families because of their connection to us. They are under attack. You know, Job, when the Bible says Job was attacked, it wasn't just Job's health and Job's wealth. They attacked his children and attacked his marriage. His wife says, you ought to curse God and die. You don't think that was the devil? <laughs> Pray for us. Now, before I go, listen to this. This is deep because when Paul says to the church he's leading, pray for us, he is talking to people at various levels of spiritual maturity. Most of them are less spiritually mature than him, but he's asking them to pray for him. The reason why I say this is because most of how many of you have ever in your life, by hands up in the chat all over the campus, how many of you ever in your life asked anybody to pray for you? How many of you ever asked somebody, right? Now, now think about this. When you ask somebody to pray for you, don't you really try to find somebody you know who know how? <laughs> He'd be like, I, I, ain't try, I ain't trying to ask my friends, man. I know you can't get one through. <laughs> You, you going to be, you know that grand, everybody got a grandmother that can get through, boy. She, she be talking to Jesus in a rocking chair and don't play no games and only listen to Mahalia Jackson. <laughs> so you, pray, you ask somebody to pray for you because you know they ain't ordinary. Yeah. They're they going to move heaven. Yeah. So that makes sense, right? It's logical for me to ask you to pray for me because I know your prayer carries weight. Yeah. But Paul is asking people to pray for him. Some of them don't even know how to start the prayer. 
Why would he ask people less mature than him to pray for him when he had been praying for them? And it is because of this, because it's not who's praying, it's who they're praying to. Yeah. He's saying, if you can talk to God, I can use that. <laughs> Even if you don't know how to say it, I can use your prayer because it's not who you are, it's who's listening to your prayer. That's why I'm telling you that God's honest truth. If all you can say is my name, I'm going to say for myself, if all you can say is prayer is, in prayer is, Lord, help Keith battle. If that's your four-word prayer, I'll take it because I need the help. Lord, help Keith battle. You might say, Keith, Lord, help Keith. I'll take them three words. If that's all you got, you might be new to the faith, Lord, help Keith. That's it, I'll take it. Now, somebody else might have been in the faith 30 years. They might go like this, Father God, we come to you right now on behalf of our leader. Our leader. Yeah, we come to you lifting up the man of God, M-A-N-D, man of God. We come, oh, Father, because you's good, great God that you are. And we ask you to stretch forth your hand through eternity and reach down and, and touch him from the crown of his head <laughs> to the soles of his feet. <laughs> and then, Lord, see about him in his down sitting and his uprising. <laughs> Lord, bless him as he comes and goes. <laughs> Make him the head and not the tail. <laughs> Above and not beneath. <laughs> the lender, not the borrower. Yes, Lord. Let me tell you something. If you pray like that, I appreciate it. But I'm telling you what else I appreciate. I appreciate you just saying, Lord, help Keith. I ain't tripping. Both of them work because it ain't the length of the prayer. It's the, it's the God who receives it. I'm still going to get help either way. Whether you say, Lord, help keep. Oh, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. Uh, no other help I know. Pray all that for me. Now, this was going to mess y'all up. I'm going to lose about 500 of y'all right here. You're going to move your membership right now. You'd be surprised at which one of them prayers sounds like the way I pray for y'all. Y'all be saying, pray for me, Pastor Battle. Let me tell you how I pray. You think I'm saying, Father, stretch your hand. You know what I say? Lord, bless Keisha and Rollo. In Jesus' name, amen. That's it. That's all I got. I don't say, go see about them in the midnight hour. <laughs> say nothing. Lord, bless Keisha and Rollo. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I know you're about to leave. You're about to leave right now. I'm gone. I want somebody going to stretch their hand across the eternity of time. Let me, let me illustrate this, why, why, why it really doesn't matter. It's not the length. Let's say we're all going to McDonald's, and three of us, we're going to McDonald's, we're in, going through drive through We're in three separate cars, we're going through drive through and we all want the same thing, we want a Big Mac. I'm not a Big Mac person, but it's going to work for this illustration. Um, I was told the Big Mac order number drive through is one. Number one, so I get up in the line first, and I go pull up in the line, and I pull up to the thing, and they say, welcome to McDonald's, may I take your order? And I simply say, number one. They say, will that complete your order? I say, yes. So I pull up. You pull up right behind me, and they say to you, welcome to McDonald's, may I take your order? And you say, yes. May I have a Big Mac, please? Yes, may I have a Big Mac, please? That's eight words. I say it too. They say, would that complete your order? You say, yes. You pull up. Third person pulls up behind you. They get to the window. They say, welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? They say, may I have two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun? That's 20 words. Would that complete your order? Yes. They pull up. Now, if this was the right kind of church, y'all already be standing up. Because the point is... Whether I said two words, or I said eight words, or I said 20 words, when I pull up, we're going to all get the same thing. <laughs> it's a Big Mac waiting on us. So it don't matter how long you pray. It doesn't matter what kind of car you in. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter how many verses you know. Pull up, call it two words, eight words, 20 words. Lord help, Father, I stretch through the eternity of time. Because the way you get a Big Mac is you got to ask the person that has it. Ooh, God. 
You, you can go to Chick-fil-A all you want. You can be as articulate as you want to be. You can be in the Chick-fil-A standing line. You can be in a Rolls Royce at Chick-fil-A. You can ask, you can spell Big Mac in French. You are not getting a Big Mac. But when I stretch my hand to the right person, to the right one who is God, I can get what I ordered even if I order it quick. Number one. That's what I'm going to start praying for y'all. Number one. Because let me tell you something. Let me say something. There's not a day that goes by that somebody doesn't hit me up and say, Pastor, can you pray for me? Can you pray for my family? Can you pray for my job? It ain't looking good. Can you pray for my business? We, we're trying to recover from COVID. Can you, can, you pray, can you pray for my child? They're running tests. Can you pray for this interview I got coming up? This is the second interview. We really want this, Pastor. Can you, can you, can you, put your, can you give me a scripture? Pastor, can you pray for that situation over in Haiti? Can you, can you pray for what's going on in Gaza, the Israeli, Israeli and Palestinian war? Can you pray for that? Can you pray for what's going on in Ukraine? I didn't hear you pray for that, Pastor. Can you pray for what's going on in our schools? Can you pray for this gun violence? Can you pray for, can you, Pastor, can you pray for this? Can, brother say, hey, hey, Rev, send one up for me, Rev. <laughs> hey, this your sister calling, Pastor. Can you pray for me? And then some of y'all are real gangster with it. You'd be like, hey, Pastor, keep me in prayer. <laughs> that's extra. Keep me in prayer. That, that's that 24-7 hotline. Like, <laughs> Don't just pray once for my family. Keep us in prayer. Like, I got to hold y'all up every day for every second. Lord, 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 Lord. Keisha, 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 Keisha. Lord, Keisha, Keisha, Keisha. Rollo, Keisha. They need you. Lord, from the heavenly fields, stretch forth your mighty hand. Come thou fount of every blessing. You just ex keep me in prayer. And all I'm saying is, pray for us. Pray for us. Listen, there, not because of our title, but because of the work. Yeah. That's what gave Paul the right to say, pray for us. Now, you know who I am. Now, you know what, it, what we do. Pray for us. Pray for us. So you got four takeaways. You ready? You only got four takeaways today. Here it is. Honor your leaders. Greatly respect them. Love them wholeheartedly. And pray for us. If you're only going to do one, pray for us. It ain't got to be long. Lord help Keith. Lord help Larry Nem. <laughs> you say Larry, you got to say Nim. I'm excited about today because this is a day where our new members are coming on board to our church. It's the Right Hand of Fellowship Sunday. And... I wish I could be there as I am for Washington to greet you in person. I really do. I wish I could be there as I am land over with you in person. But on behalf of my wife, Vicki, and I, just we give you a virtual hug and welcome you to our church. And I'm going to turn the service over now to your campus hosts as we welcome our new members today. <laughs>